for eight hours. Hey everyone, welcome to the SYA Admissions Google Hangout. Tonight I am Kate Martell, the Admissions Marketing Ma Manager here at School Year Abroad. And I have with me tonight Uchenna. Uchenna, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello everyone, absolutely. My name is Uchenna Azibe. I am an Assistant Director of Admissions at School Year Abroad, and I'm also an alum of the School Year Abroad France program. And I'm very happy to be with you all. Great, thanks Uchenna. So tonight we're going to talk um, with Uchenna a little bit about his experiences at SYA. And if you have questions, please put them in the chat box on the right, and we will do our best to answer them. We are going to go through some of the FAQs, so your questions may be answered as we go along. Um, so Uchenna, do you want to give us a brief overview of SYA for people that are just tuning in and just learning about school year abroad? Sure, absolutely. So School Year Abroad, or as we like to call it, SYA, is a year-long study abroad and homestay program. It is for high school juniors and seniors. And we operate four schools located in Italy, Spain, France, and China. Our school in Italy is located in Viterbo, which is about an hour north of Rome. Our school in Spain is located in Zaragoza, which is right in between Barcelona and Madrid, about two and a half hours from each. Our school in France is located in Rennes, which is the historic capital of Brittany. And our school in China is located in Beijing. And while abroad, you live with the host family, you take your classes, and then you come back to your home school and you, and you things pick up right where you left off. So. Great. And do you want to just mention the language requirements by country Absolutely. real quick? Absolutely. So in order to study at SY in France or SY in Spain, you have to have completed at least two years in the target language. SY Italy and SY China, however, have no language requirement and you are free to apply as a beginner. Now, if you do have experience in Mandarin or Latin, then you're welcome to still apply and you will be in accelerated classes. But if you are a complete beginner in either one of those languages, you are still eligible to enroll. And the reason for that is because the classes in France and Spain are taught in French and Spanish except for English and math which are taught in English. And in China and Italy, the classes become progressively um, more in Italian and Mandarin as the year goes on. Absolutely. Um, so we're going to talk with Uchana a little bit about his experience. If you do have questions, put them in the chat box. I see one coming in already. So we'll do our best to answer those after we talk to Uchana for a couple of minutes. Um, so Uchana, if you could start in the very beginning, how did you hear about SYA? Where did you go to school? Um, and how did you decide to apply, to apply? Absolutely. So I went to school at Sidwell Friends in Washington, D.C. And the very first time that I heard about SYA, it actually was one of my French teachers who told me and, and, and suggested to me to attend an info session. Uh, school year abroad was coming to Sidwell. And um, my French teacher thought that it would be a good idea for me to at least examined the opportunity, so she encouraged me to attend. Now, before hearing about SYA, I had not really thought about opportunities like that. I was not the typical student who was thinking about study abroad for years before uh, actually learning about SYA. It was actually a concept that was rather new to me. So um, I had a lot of things to, to learn and to think about and to consider, but um, that, that very first kind of the seed that, that that teacher planted and saying, I think you would be a good match for SYA, um, that, uh, that, that seed eventually you know, took root and next thing you know, I was going abroad. So the reason why I was convinced by that info session that I decided to apply was um, even though I, had, I hadn't really traveled a lot, I had not really thought about things on, on a global scale, but I was always someone who wanted to go out and, and experience the world. I had never had the opportunity to do that, but, but within me, I had always said, I want to go and see what these places are like that I hear about. I want to go out and, 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 and be in the world. Um, at the time, I also toyed with the idea of um, diplomacy, being a diplomat. When I got older, I didn't really know what that, I didn't really know what that <laughs> entailed, but um, that was, yeah, I said it, it sounds like a cool opportunity, and that also would be a cool way to see and experience the world. So that was, you know, kind of sort of the direction that I wanted to go in. And then once I actually learned about the opportunity and, and, and learned about I can stay with the host family, 
I'll be you know, continuing my classes. I learned that it was something that actually was feasible to do. I, uh, I said, let me go ahead and apply. And once I got in, it was pretty much set. By the time that I was accepted, I had already researched it enough that I convinced myself that if I get in, I'm going. And um, the, the minute I got, you know, the I got word that I was accepted, I, I was I was pretty set on, on attending. And I'm happy that I did. We're happy that you did too. <laughs> so um, talk a little bit about classes. What were some of your favorite classes? Um, how was it different from your homeschool? Were there were there similarities? Talk a little bit about that. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so the, the class structure was actually rather similar to my homeschool. Classes went for about an hour. Um, the day started at about, uh, I think it started at about 8.30. Yeah. So I, I was fairly familiar with the structure of the school. Because we are with Americans, and SYA doesn't put you into an actual French or Spanish or Chinese school, um, some of the structure of the school may be, may be familiar. You're not going to school in the Spanish or Chinese uh, system, if you will. But my teachers were French, yeah. and my classes were in French. And that was, along with being in a new country and experiencing all that, that was very, very different. So when I first arrived, I'll be honest, I wasn't very confident in my French. I was not the most stellar French student before I went to SYA. So when I first arrived, I did, you know, I, I was worried if I would be able to keep up and if I would be able to actually take these classes in French. And one thing I did not take into consideration was that your classes are in French, but your host family's talking to you in French. The street signs are in French. The yeah. TV is in French. The radio is in French. Your life is now in French. Your life, your entire <laughs> life is now in French. Yeah. So while when I first got there, I was wondering how on earth am I going to be able to, to keep up and how am I going to absorb this language and these, these topics in, in French, very quickly I realized that you almost kind of subconsciously, your brain subconsciously switches over and you become very comfortable very quickly only because your entire life is reinforcing that language acquisition. And I was used to taking language for 45 minutes a day, three days a week. And I thought, you know, yeah, know that's French. as good as it gets. Right. And I thought, yeah. oh, I know French. Yeah, exactly. I thought yeah. that I was great at it. And then when I, when I got there, I realized how much work there was that I needed to do. But it moved surprisingly fast because it's not really work necessarily. You're, you're learning this language so you can experience the city, so you can travel and you can be, you know, you don't have to rely on your host family when you're going places. You're learning the language because it is part of your life. And very, very quickly, I, I got very confident with my French and I, and I was, I was very, very comfortable um, and things just took off. So. Yeah. And Ren is such a nice city too. Everyone there is so nice. Don't start me reminiscing. I'll they'll go be on. forgiving if you make a faux pas or a little absolutely, mistake. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so another part of SYA and uh, FAQ we always receive is about extracurriculars, co-curriculars. Do you want to talk about a little bit about that? Something maybe that you did or um, the process of sure. enrolling in co-curriculars? Sure, absolutely. So. When I first got to France, I met with uh, the co-curricular coordinator. And we sat down one-on-one, -on -one and she asked me, OK, what things are you interested in? Well, what things do you do back home? And I was a lacrosse player. And unfortunately, there was not lacrosse in France at that time. So I was a little short out of luck there. And she gave me a list of all of these opportunities in then, which because it's such a, you know, it's, it's it, 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 there's so much going on in rent, such a metropolitan city. There's so many opportunities to do things. And there were just all of these classes that I could pick. So, I, you know, pretty much the whole city was my oyster. So I, I ended up doing three co-curriculars. I played badminton. I did French kickboxing or savate. Cool. And I played the violin in my host family's uh, church. Um, I and, didn't know that you played the violin. Yeah, see, we'll cool. learn, learn something every day. <laughs> so yeah, and I actually was not expecting to continue the violin when I went abroad. I thought, oh, I'm going to be so sucked into learning the language, and I'm going to be so sucked into traveling, and I'm going to be so sucked into meeting people, and I'm not going to have time to play. And 
I actually realized that through playing, because I played with exclusively French people, I was playing sure. in an orchestra, and there were no other Americans at that at that church. And um, very quickly, I realized that that was one of the ways that I was embedding myself into the into Absolutely. the community. Um, and all, all three, and I, I played badminton with my host brother, who was about two years older than me, so that was a great bonding experience. Oh. And kickboxing was actually something that. You know, I just discovered on that sheet of so many opportunities, and I said, that looks interesting, and I absolutely loved it. And I've, I've continued with uh, similar martial arts since then. So, you know, it, it was one of the things that I acquired and brought back with me from France. So, cool. Yeah, we just, we're going to answer your questions, so keep going in the chat box, but I'll grab this one really quick. Opportunities for music students people who are playing instruments. Uchenna mentioned that he played with his church, but there is a conservatory in mm -hmm. Ren. Absolutely. Do you know anyone? Did anyone your year um, participate in the conservatory? I, had, I think we had a, a couple kids who sang in the conservatory. I know kids did instruments. I can't remember what instruments they played, but the conservatory is actually, um, there's an agreement. It's kind of a big deal. It's a, it's a very big deal. It's a big deal yeah. even within France. The, the conservatory of Ren is very highly regarded for uh, for the for its acting, for the music instruction, dance. for dance, for yeah. song. So um, a lot a lot of different kids did. I know two of my personal friends sung, but a lot of kids were, were doing something at the conservatory. Um, yeah, and if you check out our blog, it's info.sya.org. We did a blog last year about a girl who played the violin at the conservatory in Wren. And each year there are kids that do um, continue through music lessons or dance lessons and things like that at the conservatory. Or try something if they've never done it before. I know there was a girl um, a couple of years ago who wasn't really interested in dance before, but since she was in France, decided to try ballet. So you, you never know. Yeah. Um, what about other countries, not just France? They have music programs. Yes. So um, the co-curricular coordinator in each of our schools is someone that would help you figure out either to get lessons or if there's a conservatory nearby or um, I know in China also there's the opportunity to try some traditional Chinese instruments as well so mm -hmm. there are different um, opportunities in each country. Um, so another question we get a lot of is host families. Mm -hmm. What was your host family like? Do you want to talk a bit about the process? I know someone was wondering what happens if you need to um, change host families, that type of thing. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, the host family was one of the things that I was most nervous about before studying abroad. Because I love my family and I've only had one. So I was wondering, OK, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have a second one now. And what are they going to be like? Um, in the summer before I left, we had to fill out a questionnaire, um, more very extensive questionnaire that asked us questions on all aspects of pretty much everything to try and really get an idea of who we were as a person to try and match us with the host family because school year abroad we've been around for over 50 years and we choose very good host families but there are two parts to that there's choosing these amazing host families who are in our network that are you know eager to host students but then there's the second part of that in matching that host family with the appropriate student so we really emphasize, you know, accomplishing both of those goals. So, um, but I didn't know that at the time. So I was extremely, you know, oh my goodness, are they gonna like this? Are they gonna like that? You know, who who are they gonna be? Um, and we exchanged a couple letters before I actually arrived. Once I was assigned to my host family, we, we exchanged. Uh, I think it was two letters back and forth. And the letters, I mean, they seemed very nice. I didn't really know who they were gonna be, and I was kind of nervous and, and whatnot. And I actually remember very vividly that um, I was the last student. All the students arrived at the school. We fly into Paris, and then we, you know, we, we arrived in France, which is about two and a half hours away. And I was the very last student <laughs> to be picked up by their oh, host. Oh, like on a kickball team. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> you know, like a puppy in the window, just like looking for an owner. Where's so my family? There you go. There you go. So I, I was very nervous because I was like, maybe they don't want me. Maybe that's why they're oh, late. Okay. It, it was all just, it was ridiculous. But that, that's what you think sure. before you meet up with them. Yeah. Um, I absolutely, uh, my other friends who were there my year will argue with me, but I had bar none, best host family 
Um, I would argue that that's the way it's probably ever used, but I would obviously <laughs> be biased. Um, I felt in Everyone's love Everyone's going to want your host family. Yeah. Legitimately, they were great. I mean, just as far as uh, the family composition, you know, I had an older brother, which I really wanted. Um, I, I, they were just literally, my, the, my, the mother's name was Mary, and my mom's name is Marilyn, but she goes by Marie. So they're, they're literally, my mother's names were the same name. That is how <laughs> perfectly the family was matched. Um, I still talk to them at least once a month over Skype or email. I've been back on three separate occasions and I've stayed with them. I fell in love with them. We used to, I mean, hang out all of the time. Yeah. Um, I missed them terribly. Yeah. And it was a, it was a, it was, I mean, I can't overemphasize how perfect the match was. And I graduated seven years ago and I've, I've kept in touch with them monthly ever since. And I, I called them within a very short time. I called them mama and papa. That's how close uh, I became to them. So. And it yeah. is a two way street. I mean, I've heard that it's, it's sort of an SYA in general, and you've said this before, it is what you put into it is what you get out of it too. So, you know, engaging with your host family, mm -hmm. talking to them, asking them questions, um, not necessarily hiding out in your room when you, so when you come home from school. You know, they want to be social with you. They want to share their culture and everything with you. They want to teach you. Um, so it is one of those, you get what you, what you give and Absolutely. that type of thing. Absolutely. Um, if you invest in, in, in that family and spend right. time with them and you can be somewhat open culturally because they are going to be, whether you're in Italy or China or France, it is going to be a different culture. Even though Europe and America have so many similarities culture-wise, um, and you're going to have to keep that in mind. And if you're able to keep that kind of openness of, of open, open mentality and openness yeah. of spirit, it's it's you know it, it's gonna go uh, very well and then to, to touch on I believe the question said what happens if sometimes the host family is, is not the best yeah. um, it's very rare thankfully because since we've been doing it for so long and we're so good at matching these host families it's you know uh, you know nine out of ten cases are uh, wonderful cases um, we do realize that sometimes personalities clash two people uh, or a family and a student. For, yeah. for one reason or another, whether the family situation changes or, um, you know, or some reason. Or good on paper. And, exactly, yeah. exactly. So um, in those cases, uh, we do, we, we have so many host families who are eager to host students that we will switch that student to a family that is a little bit more... Um, suitable. Yeah, that is yeah. more suitable for them. So you're definitely not stuck with that family when you first arrive. Yeah. Uh, there, there, are, there are, you know, you, you have the potential to switch. And it's all about communication too, yeah. you know, starting with communicating with them, um, talking to the RD if something comes up, um, things like that, you know, the, the RD is always there to help um, if anything arises like that too. Absolutely, and, and the, the RD and also the host family coordinator, there's gonna yeah. be someone there who their job was to learn who you were as a person over the summer, match you with that host family, um, go through the whole process of vetting and interviewing these host families, which is a which is a long process that goes over months. So that that host family coordinator and that RD or that resident director are going to be very involved in the process, and both of them will be able to um, you know help you with the intricacies yeah. of navigating that relationship. Sometimes it's simple misunderstandings, and the part that uh, Uchenna, it, um, you know. When a student is accepted, they fill out that host family questionnaire. You fill it out and your parents fill it out. Mm -hmm. So it asks you all kinds of questions about you and your family at home and the type of family you're interested in. So it's important to be open and honest on that form because then the more information that we have about you um, and the things that you're interested in, the better we can ma make that match. Absolutely. Um, we'll ask a couple more questions of Luciana, and then we do have a bunch of questions in the chat box. So uh, let's talk about favorite school trip. Ooh, favorite school People trip. talking about travel. Um, ha -ha. So my favorite school trip, and this actually ties into my favorite class that I did not mention earlier, but my favorite school trip was when we went to the Loire Valley. And the Loire Valley in France is the region where you have a lot of these picturesque castles um, Chateau de Chambord, and which is that stereotypical castle that you see on a lot of French postcards. And the reason that was my favorite trip 
uh, ties into what was one of my favorite classes, which was art history class. Now, before going to France, I, I had no interest in art history. I wasn't artistic. I wasn't interested in history. So the combination <laughs> of the two, it, it wasn't it wasn't something that you know excited me before I went. Um, and I think that's why when I got there and I, I, I enrolled in an art history class and I learned about concepts, I learned about the history of art in France, I learned about the, the, the sculpture, the painting, the architecture, all the different aspects, the different eras um, or ages. It, it, it was something that really, I mean, just sucked me in. I was, I was, I was totally obsessed with learning all I could, especially the architectural side of France's art history. Now, that being said, the thing about SY classes is that you're going to learn about something in class, and then you're going to go and see that thing in person. And you're going to see and touch and taste the thing that you've been learning about in your, in your courses. So spending weeks studying the castles of the Loire Valley and the castles that Louis XIV you know, stayed in and, and making this history, seeing this history on paper, and then going with my school and actually being in front of these things and seeing them, that was just a very powerful moment for me. So it comes alive. Yeah, it, it, it legitimately does. I mean, you, you look at these four floor plans of these castles and your teacher is talking about, you know, and, and the class itself is interesting. You know, class itself at SYA is, is interesting because as we mentioned earlier, you're you're learning about what you're immersed in. But then to go and actually see these things and to, to see them through the eyes of not a tourist, but someone who is for that time a resident of that country. Is, is, is rather powerful. So that was my favorite trip uh, by far. Nice. Yeah. Um, and I believe we have pictures. Uh, we have a slideshow up on our website, um, sya.org. If you scroll to the bottom on the news panel, we have a slideshow from the Loire Valley. We have mm -hmm. a video from Italy of um, their first month, Beijing first month, Spain, a couple of blogs about their first month, and a lot of them talk about the travel that you do initially, just right out, right out of the gate. Yeah, yeah, you know, in October, as November, soon as you arrive, taking trips. Mm -hmm. and I think it's, I think each, each, I think it's almost like six weeks of travel that mm -hmm. uh, that you that you throughout go on the throughout the year. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's you, you know, you get ex extensive opportunities to see, um, see the country beyond the city where you're living. Um. So Kayla wanted to know what you do on vacations, and I was mm -hmm. also going to ask you about winter break. Awesome, awesome, very good question. So um, about vacations, one of the most common questions that I get on the road is, can you go home during vacation? And, and what we say to that is, we're going to allow you to go home. We're not going to keep you from, from being able to go and see your family. So you're allowed to go home, but we do discourage it, because if you go home, you're going to lose a lot of that language acquisition, you're going to lose a lot of that cultural immersion. Um, and you may come back and you may pick back up right where you left, but we say it's a lot better to have your family come and visit you. And the reasons for that is because by the time winter break rolls around, you've become one of the best tour guides mm -hmm. imaginable. Not only have you acquired the language, and you can navigate the country and speak the language, um, you have traveled extensively, so you know the different uh, sites around the country. Um, you've been in the culture, so you can culturally navigate. And whenever you understand the culture of a place and you're not approaching it from kind of a tour tourist mentality, that just gives you a whole different window and a whole different perspective. You know, when you're, when you're talking to people, they're, gonna, they're, they're going to treat you differently because they know that you are... Uh, you have a perspective into their culture, into their language, into their country that the average tourist doesn't have. Sure. So, um, so I, I have two break stories. One of my breaks, spring break, my mom came and visited me, and I took her all over France. I cooked the French dishes that I had learned how to cook. I navigated and spoke all through everywhere that we went, and, and, and it was just, that was a moment where I really saw the benefits of study abroad, because I saw how proud my mom was, firstly, yeah. and I saw how easy it was for me to just say, okay, so we're gonna go to Paris, you know, and I have this whole itinerary of what we're gonna do in Paris, and it's not the typical, we were seeing the typical sites, but I'm able to talk about it on a whole different level. And then when we go to these places, when we speak French, you know, it, it, it's, it's, you're gonna get treated differently by the people who are, you know, taking you on tours and serving you and all of that. So. Um, 
So that was very powerful t- for me to, to be. And also when my mom came and, and stayed with my host family, who you know spoke very little English, my mom and my host mom became very good friends. But my host mom could say, hello, how are you? That was basically it. Sure. So they became friends through me doing the translation and, mm-hmm. and just seeing seeing two different cultures and having to do the translation and then okay I know what you meant to say and then you know <laughs> that was that was a very interesting uh, uh, and rewarding experience as well so I highly suggest have your family come and visit you you'll, it'll be you'll, you'll you'll it'll make you feel uh, very accomplished and the other type of break that I had was during winter break or during Christmas when I actually didn't I did not go home I know a couple of students did go home. A lot of us wanted to stay because we wanted to experience Christmas in France, which, you know, I mean, culturally, staying during the holidays is always very interesting. And maybe something you're never going to do again. And something you're never going to be able to do again. Um, and during Christmas, I, I, a couple of weeks before we went, my host mother told me we're going to go and we're going to stay in a monastery for Christmas. And I was, and there's no internet, and there's no TV, and there's nothing. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm going to, oh, this is I'm not going to be fun. I'm yeah. going to die. That's what I thought. <laughs> Um, and lo and behold, it was one of the most amazing trips or breaks that I had while I was there because it was something that I never would have done in another context. And we were in the middle of a beautiful forest in Brittany in a beautiful abbey, you know, surrounded by these very, very uh, kind monks and nuns. And that was my Christmas. And I had an amazing time doing something that I originally thought I would not enjoy. And I think that's kind of indicative of the SYA experience. You may feel, you may have these kind of opinions. Right, right. But you have to experience it. You will never know what it's like until you do it. And if you do it, you'll most likely enjoy it. So, you know, there you go. Never know. But your host family is committed to you. So if you don't go home for winter break, which most students do not, um, or if your family doesn't come to visit you, you uh, will be with your host family experiencing the holidays with them. Um, so never fear. Mm-hmm. Um, how about Thanksgiving? Um, Thanksgiving, I think each of the schools do put on a small party for mm-hmm. the students. Mm-hmm. Um, so with some pie. Yeah, I don't there was, there was turkey and, and when I was there, <laughs> friend, a lot of the, and the French know how to cook, so the food was delicious. Yeah. It may not have tasted exactly like my grandma's cooking, but it was it was a great Thanksgiving. We all get together and, and with the teachers and the students, and it's, it's very nice. Yeah. So I know they will be fine. Yes. Um, be fine. So one more quick question, and then we'll try to get to a couple of these questions before we have to go. But um, if you want to just sum up why you were glad, why you're glad that you went, mm-hmm. other than for the fact that we wouldn't be hanging out right now. There we go. It. That that's number one. And um, how is SYA? Uh, it influenced your choices. Did it influence your college choices, your career choices? Absolutely. Obviously, your career choices at this point. Right, right. To some extent, most definitely. Um, it ha- it had a big influence. I can unequivocally say it was the most formative year of, of, of my life uh, so far because I mean I just learned so much about myself. You know, I, when when you go abroad, the only thing that you're taking from your old life is you and you know clothes in the suitcase so you know a lot of the things that were part of your life are not there anymore and you're going to learn a lot about yourself when kind of those those things around you change um i i mean i ended up being a french government major in college i ended up choosing to go to uh well Bowdoin college was my first choice and i learned about it and and uh decided to apply to it while I was in France. My math teacher actually was a Bowdoin graduate and, and suggested the school to me. And after I researched it, I was like, this is where I want to go. Um, because they had a strong government program. And after uh, being in France, I, I said, yeah, this foreign service thing is definitely something that I'm interested in. Um, but they also had strong languages. And I never thought before I went abroad to be a language major. And I ended up doubling in government in French because I'll be honest, after studying abroad at SYA, I mean, it was almost a given. It was so easy yeah. to, to, to be able to, you know, complete those classes. Um, and I, since then, I've been absolutely uh, obsessed with the Francophone world. I studied abroad again in college. I went to Morocco. And, and the reason why I really wanted to go was because I wanted that Francophone experience again. I was studying Arabic, and I wanted to acquire Arabic, but I, I knew that I wanted to study abroad again in a Francophone country. Um, after leaving Bowdoin, I uh, right after I graduated, I got a job 
as an English teaching assistant at the University of Brest, which is a French town west of Rennes by about two, two and a half hours. Um, and I immediately, upon seeing the job posting, leapt on it and, and said, this is what I want, because I was so, I, I missed Brittany so much. It's such a wonderful region. I missed my host family dearly. I missed being in France. And, and I believe that a big part of me being accepted for that job and me being successful and comfortable when I arrived there and being able to, to really feel at home when I arrived was because I had already spent a year in Brittany. I already knew what that was like culturally, language-wise. I was already fluent in French. Um, so I think that was a big factor in them uh, accepting me. So it, it's, it's absolutely, you know, totally added something to my educational and professional life that I never thought would be a part of it. This whole language and this whole population of people in the world who I never would have been able to talk to or interact with right. um, unless I had that language. I mean, French is spoken on you know five different continents. So that just opens up the world. And then I mean, Mandarin and, and, and Spanish and, um, and I mean, Italian, just having this window into a whole different population, you, you can't do that through Google Translate. You have to, <laughs> you know, you have to be able to speak the language and you have to be able to speak the culture. You have to be able to understand culturally what it's like to navigate um, with those people. So those were the big benefits to SYA. And I'm still riding on the coattails of those benefits. So just yesterday, my Uber driver was from Haiti. And what was originally a very sullen and, you know, very calm, Uber ride, the minute I said, are you Haitian? And I switched over to French. He lit up and talked about his wonderful life in Haiti and bringing his children here and his plans. And, and it was just so interesting talking to this guy, but he was a different person before he knew I spoke French yeah, and afterwards. Yeah, and that happens very often, so. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. Absolutely. So let's go through some of these questions and we're not gonna have time for all of them, but um, if we don't, we will get back to you. Um, with some answers individually, but um, let's talk about PSATs, college prep, oh, yeah. that type of thing. Um, That's a good will one. we have time to take the PSATs? Yes. Absolutely. You will have time to take the PSATs. In fact, all of our sites are registered sites for standardized testing, so you'll take the PSAT and the SAT, and those, those standardized tests right there at the school. Um, not only that, but we all four of our sites have an organ a company that comes and does test prep. I believe it's on a bi-weekly yeah. basis uh, during during I test think so. season. I'm not positive about the schedule. Mm -hmm. but. Exactly. So, um, but they'll 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 come on a regular basis. Uh, yeah. We're not sure about the schedule, but they'll come on a regular basis and they'll do test prep classes. And then for those students who want to do one-on-one -on -one sessions, they'll be able to do those one-on-ones as well. Um, private, yeah, private classes. So there's lots of opportunities for for that. And as far as college is concerned. Each one of our sites also has a college counseling liaison that will work directly with the college counselor at the home school of our students to make sure that our students are staying on track. Um, so you'll meet one-on-one -on -one with them. They'll go over your, your choices. They'll go over the college application process. Yeah. Um, I just remember the office of the college counseling liaison looked exactly like the college counseling <laughs> office at my home school, just full of fist guys. Colleges. Yeah, yeah. Every year, this guy, even though it may change by like four or five mm -hmm. schools, they have every year, and, and they have all of the college application uh, uh, resources that that you may need. So I really didn't feel like I was behind the ball at all while I was abroad. And John, uh, AP exams as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, APs as well. Yep. Um, here's a interesting one. Do you have any regrets or anything you wish you had done when you went to France? Ooh. Oh, that's a good question. Do I have any regrets? Mm. I wish I could stay longer. Yeah, I gotta think on that one because I mean, yeah, I have to think on that one. I I I would say my I would say if I was to say one regret, the 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 first my kind of trepidation the first couple of weeks that I was there was totally unfounded. Um, I was nervous to talk to my host family because I thought my French was bad, so I didn't really talk to them very much. Um, I didn't want to embarrass myself culturally, so I kind of mm -hmm. kept to myself. And it's only lasted a couple of weeks. And then I started realizing that they were great people and we were fast friends. And then I, I opened up, you know, totally. But I would say that that time that I was fearful of saying or doing the wrong thing, there's no need for that because they knew that I was an American who couldn't speak French fluently and who had never been 
to France and who had never, you know, so, so yeah. it took me time to warm up and say, okay, this is a safe place for me to be myself and I don't have to pretend that I already have, you know, this cultural awareness that I don't. And I, you know, make the mistakes. You won't know the mistakes until you make them. And, and you know, I've learned that the mistakes are hilarious and that they don't care when you make them anyway because it's yeah. a laughing point. Right. So. And you won't make that mistake again once you. And, know, and you won't make that mistake again. <laughs> exactly. So, um, yeah, maybe my nervousness in the beginning, but was that a regret? I mean, that was just kind of natural. That's something that I feel like when you when you go out into that different comfort zone, or when you go out of your comfort zone, that's almost a a. a yeah. A natural reaction, but um, you're the only thing holding you back. Right, you're the only <laughs> thing holding you back. So if I wasn't in my own way, then I'd say that was more regret. And I was in my own way for a little bit of time. Well, uh, if I think of something, if I think of something else, I'll, yeah. I'll I'll jump back in. Yeah. Um, opportunities to meet with kids your age who are from your host country. Great question. I know mm -hmm. you mentioned that through extracurriculars is often a great way, um, while informal, to meet kids your age, whether it's playing on the local soccer team or mm -hmm. taking cooking classes and things like that. Um, but also, I know in Spain, for example, they um, the journalism class is having um, Spanish students come and they're making a bilingual um, student newspaper for example, mm -hmm. and um, they have lots of different groups in each um, country, international, Gemellagio in Italy, which translates into twins, so it's your Italian um, peers, and you meet, I think on a weekly basis, to talk about current events, talk about your lives, talk about movies, whatever it is teenagers right. talk about. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. whatever you guys are talking about these days, um, um, totally. So yeah, there are lots of opportunities through classes and then sort of um, loosely through extracurriculars mm -hmm. um, in each of the schools. Sorry, there's a lot. I'll, of I'll also say that um, you also will have the opportunity to do a school exchange where you can attend a local high school for a week if, yep. you, if you you know so desire. So that's a great way to, to, I mean, you'll be paired with a national at a high school and you'll shadow them for that week. So that's a great way to experience it. Um, and I know in France at least, um, which is the only place that I can speak of from personal experience. We had two high schools that were about five minutes down the road in both directions, and we would eat lunch at those schools. Mm -hmm. um, and you know that was a great way to to, to meet students our age. Um, we would go on events, like you know, instead of maybe having like homecoming back at our home school, they have balls in France. So we would go to the balls of the of the neighboring schools. Um, and you know, little, little little things through that partnership, and you you know you end up. Kind of making friends naturally, so um, we'll both provide opportunities for that to happen, and then it'll also kind of happen through yeah. co-curriculars and through eating lunch and yeah. through things like and that. Your host brothers and sisters, and exactly, that sort of absolutely. Um, I think we're going to have to wrap up because we are actually running over. Um, but for those of you whose questions we didn't get to answer, we will follow up with you, and you can also follow up with us. Um, We'll put Uchenna's email in the chat box, and we'll put the email for the general SYA admissions email there, too. Um, do you want to wrap up? Because there was a question, too, and, and we'll kill two birds with one stone, talking about deadlines. Um, are they rolling, or are all decisions made after February 1st? Um, do you want to talk about financial aid and scholarships sure. first, and then deadlines? Sure, okay. absolutely. So. Um, S-Way has generous need-based financial aid. We give over $3 million a year in financial aid. So our financial aid uh, is generous. But we also have merit scholarships um, in all four of our countries. So you have the opportunity to, you know, your financial aid will be need-based. You can also uh, supplement your application with the merit scholarship application. You'll have to do some extra things in order to apply for a merit scholarship, but you can also apply for those scholarships as well. If you are interested in applying for one of the merit scholarships, you have to apply by February 1st. Mm -hmm. um, and all other general applications are welcome uh, anytime before February 15th. And if you have any financial aid information to send in, um, that also has to be sent in before February 15th. So a question we always get is, can you apply for both? And yes, you can apply for a scholarship and you can apply for financial aid. Yes. Different things. Yes, you can apply for both. And there is also a Halsey scholarship, which is a full ride plus mm -hmm. airfare. 
So if you go on our website um, under admissions, you can go to sya.org backslash scholarships. And there's information about that. There's financial aid, how-tos. It walks you through the steps of how to apply if you've never done that before. If you are at an independent school and you've applied for financial aid, the process is pretty much exactly the same. It's the same process. Um, and there is more information step-by-step uh, -step there. Um, so the deadlines, yes, for scholarships. If you're applying for a scholarship, February 1st. If you're just applying to the general deadline, Feb 15, and financial aid paperwork is due February 15th as well. Um, and then there are set dates for notifications after that. A few weeks after that is when you will hear in your online account um, the messages will be posted um, in the middle of March, I believe. I think, yeah, it's mid-March. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they go out. Um, let's see. I think that's all we're going to be able to get to tonight. Um, if, I, like I said, we'll put our information of how to contact us in the chat box. Um, if you have other specific questions, you can feel free to email SYA Admissions. I'll put their email address there. Follow us on social. We've got a great Instagram account. Um, we're School Year Abroad on Instagram, and we have some awesome pictures coming in from our campus reporters. So if you follow us on Instagram, Facebook, we're SYA Admissions, and Twitter, we're SYA Admissions. Um, and we have campus reporters in each of our four schools that send us blogs and videos and tons of photos. So go check those out. They're all posted up there. And um, we hope that everyone has a happy Thanksgiving. Yes, happy Thanksgiving, everyone. And thank you for joining us. Thank we you appreciate so much for joining us. It. And we hope to be hearing from, uh, from a lot of you very soon. Yes. Take care. Ciao. Bye-bye.